So today, we're diving into a case straight from the Philippine Supreme Court, and it really gets to the heart of a question that comes up in legal systems everywhere. When can authorities conduct a search without a warrant? And, you know, what makes this case particularly interesting is it all starts with something that seems, on the surface, pretty minor, just a traffic violation. Okay, so paint the picture for us. What exactly went down? So imagine this. August 2nd, 2013, we're in Makati City in the Philippines. We've got a man named Angelito Rido Niagara, and he's riding his motorcycle. He gets pulled over by the police. Now, according to the officers, they saw him driving against traffic, and when they signaled for him to stop, he tried to take off. Uh-oh. Yeah, and they claimed that this attempt to flee made them suspicious, made them think he might be up to something, and that's what they used to justify chasing after him and then searching him. So they searched him right then and there on the side of the road. They did. And did they find anything? They did. During the search, they found a firearm. Angelito was subsequently charged and convicted in the lower courts of illegal firearm possession. Okay, so open and shut case, right. Well, not so fast. The case actually ended up going all the way to the Philippine Supreme Court. And this is where things get really interesting. They overturned the lower court rulings and acquitted Angelita. Whoa, acquitted. That's a huge reversal. What made the Supreme Court change their minds? What did they see that the lower courts didn't? The Supreme Court really focused on the sequence of events, how everything went down, and more importantly, the reasoning behind that initial search. Because you see, while there are situations where police are legally allowed to conduct a search without a warrant, those are very specific and limited situations. Right, like that idea of searching someone without a warrant. I know sometimes you hear the term in flagrante delicto used. Exactly, you got it. It essentially means catching someone red-handed in the act of committing a crime, which can sometimes be used to justify a warrantless search. But in this case, the court didn't buy that argument. Why not? It sounds like he was trying to get away from the police, which, you know, seems a little suspicious, doesn't it? It does, and I'm sure that's what the police officers thought too. But it's crucial to remember that in many legal systems, there needs to be a solid reason, what's called probable cause, to justify a search, especially one that's done without a warrant. And in this case, the court really dug into whether Angelito's traffic violation alone was actually enough to establish that probable cause was simply driving the wrong way without any other signs of criminal activity sufficient to justify a search. Ultimately, they said no. So even if he was breaking a traffic law, that by itself didn't automatically give the police the right to search him. Precisely. And to back up their decision, the court pointed to a number of previous cases in Philippine law, Picardal v. People, Mendoza v. People, and Luz v. People, where warrantless searches based solely on minor traffic infractions were found to be unlawful. These cases set a precedent. A minor traffic violation on its own doesn't give the police free reign to search you. So they were looking at this case not in isolation, but within the context of all these previous rulings, trying to see if it aligned with how the law had been applied in the past. Absolutely. And they were also paying really close attention to the specific details, the nitty gritty of the incident itself. And you see, there were some inconsistencies, some discrepancies in how the events unfolded that raised red flags. Like what? What didn't quite add up? Well, you remember how the officers claimed that they saw Angelito pull something from his waist, and that's what made them suspicious? Right. Well, later, their testimonies revealed that the firearm wasn't actually visible until after they'd already begun searching him. Hold on. So which was it? Did they see the gun before the search, or didn't they? That seems like a pretty significant detail for them to get wrong, right? You're absolutely right. It is a significant detail. And it's clear the Supreme Court thought so, too. This discrepancy in their stories, it wasn't just a minor detail. It really called into question the validity of their initial suspicion. Did they have a genuine reason to search him, or were they trying to come up with a justification after the fact? It sounds like this wasn't just about one traffic stop gone wrong. This was about something much, much bigger. Exactly. This case really gets at the heart of some fundamental legal principles. Mm. The right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, the whole concept of probable cause, the limits of police authority. And it wasn't just the police officers' actions that were being scrutinized. The Supreme Court also took into account Angelito's side of the story. Oh, right. We haven't even heard his version of events. What did he have to say about all of this? Well, Angelito maintained his innocence of the firearm charge from the very beginning. He claimed that he was simply on his way to run an errand when the police stopped him. But what he said happened next is really important. He alleged that the officers, instead of just issuing him a ticket for the traffic violation, 
demanded money from him. He's saying they tried to extort money from him. That's exactly what he claimed. And he didn't just make a vague accusation. He specifically stated that the officers threatened to plant evidence on him if he didn't pay them off. He even called his wife from the police station, asking her to bring the money. His wife? Was her testimony part of the case as well? It was. And her account of what happened lined up with his. Mm -hmm. She confirmed that he called her from the police station, frantic, begging her to get the money to give to the officers. She rushed to the station, but unfortunately wasn't able to get the amount they were demanding. Wow. So now we have conflicting accounts of the incident, questions about the legality of that search, and allegations of police misconduct. This is a lot more complicated than just a routine traffic stop. You got it. This case is like an onion. The more you peel back the layers, the more you realize it's about so much more than just whether or not this guy was carrying a firearm. It touches on police conduct, individual rights, the delicate balance of power between citizens and law enforcement. But before we get into the details of the Supreme Court's decision and what it means for the Philippines, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're back and diving right back into the case of Angelio Rodondi Guevara. And it's just amazing how this case went from a seemingly simple traffic violation to something so much bigger. It really does highlight that tension, doesn't it? That tension that exists in legal systems all around the world. Trying to find that balance between giving law enforcement the tools they need to do their job, mm. but also protecting individual rights. So let's get back to the Supreme Court's decision in this case. Knowing everything we know now, what was their reasoning for acquitting Angelito? What did they point to? Well, they ultimately concluded that that initial search, the one where the police found the firearm, was unlawful. Uh -huh. And it all goes back to that idea of probable cause that we were discussing earlier. Right, that the police need to have a really solid reason, that probable cause, before they can conduct a search, especially without a warrant. Exactly. And the court found that the officers, in this specific case, didn't have that probable cause. That alleged traffic violation in and of itself wasn't enough to justify conducting a search. So they were basically saying that even if he was driving the wrong way, that alone didn't make him a criminal, didn't give them the right to search him. Precisely. And that's a really, really important distinction that the court was making. They were emphasizing that citizens have a fundamental right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Which is something that's, you know, enshrined in legal systems all over the world, right? That idea that you can't just be searched for no reason. Absolutely. It's a cornerstone of many legal systems. And it's a right that's especially important when you're talking about something as serious as a potential firearms violation. And the court's decision in Angelito's case, it really reinforces that right and really underscores just how high that bar is for a warrantless search to be justified. This must have had huge implications for the Philippine legal system. I mean, having the highest court come out and make a ruling like that, it, it sets a precedent, doesn't it? It really does. This wasn't just about one man and one incident. It was about establishing a broader principle. So the Supreme Court, through this ruling, was sending a message, not just to lower courts, but to law enforcement, to the public, to everyone. What kind of message were they sending? A message about accountability. They were saying that the rules surrounding searches and arrests, they matter. They need to be followed. And that citizens' rights, they need to be respected. Because if the police can just search anyone, anywhere, anytime, for any reason or no reason at all, that just erodes public trust. Right. And that can lead to all sorts of problems down the line. You hit the nail on the head. And it's clear that the court was very aware of that slippery slope. By overturning Angelito's conviction, they were basically saying that the ends don't justify the means. That even if someone is suspected of a crime, the process still needs to be fair. It needs to be lawful. This whole case, it really makes you think about that balance, that constant struggle to balance keeping the public safe, but also upholding individual rights. It's a tough one. Oh, it absolutely is. And you often have really compelling arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. And some people might say that a ruling like this, it ties law enforcement's hands, makes it hard to get criminals off the streets. Right. But then there's the flip side to that argument, too. What happens if you start sacrificing individual rights in the name of security? Where do you draw that line? You're exactly right. It's a slippery slope. And the courts seem to be acknowledging that very thing. It's like they were saying, yes, of course, we need to keep the public safe, but we also need to protect people's rights. And those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can coexist. This whole case really got me thinking about the practical implications. What kind of impact might this have on actual police practices on the ground? in the Philippines, 
Do you think this will actually change how they approach things like traffic stops in the future? It's hard to say for certain what the long-term impacts will be, but it's highly likely that this will have at least some influence on how officers conduct their business. I mean, the court's decision in this case, it really does serve as a powerful reminder to law enforcement. It's a reminder that they need to operate within the boundaries of the law. That they can't just use something like a minor traffic violation as an excuse to search someone, that they need more than that. Exactly. They need that solid probable cause. They need a reasonable suspicion, that reasonable belief that someone is engaged in criminal activity. And importantly, they need to be able to articulate that. It's like the court was saying, we're watching, we're holding you accountable. Precisely. And that's an absolutely essential role that courts play in a democratic society. They act as that check and balance, ensuring that the rights of the people are safeguarded. You know, this deep dive has just been fascinating. We've unpacked so much legal precedents, the ins and outs of probable cause, that constant balancing act between ensuring public safety while still protecting individual liberties. And we've seen how a single case, a case that, as we keep saying, started with something as seemingly mundane as a traffic stop, can raise these really profound questions about the law, about justice, about those fundamental rights that we all too often take for granted. As we wrap up this part of our deep dive, is there one lasting thought that you really want to leave our listeners with? What's the key takeaway here from Angelito's story? I think the most important takeaway here is that the law, it's not static, it's not set in stone, it's constantly evolving. And that evolution is a good thing, right? I mean, that's how progress happens. It absolutely can be a good thing. It means that our legal systems, they're capable of learning, of adapting to new realities, of becoming more just, more equitable over time. It's a reminder that we should never stop questioning, never stop pushing for progress. Absolutely. Mm. And that we should never, ever take our rights for granted because mm. those rights, they're the foundation. They're what make a just and equitable society possible. Well said. Angelito's case, it's given us all a lot to think about. Listeners, we always love to hear from you, so be sure to share your thoughts on this case. Let us know what you think. You can find us on all the usual social media channels. And until our next deep dive, keep those minds engaged. Keep asking those tough questions. Keep exploring those issues that matter. And most importantly, thanks for joining us on this journey. It's a journey into the heart of a legal battle, but also a journey that reminds us that the fight for justice, it's ongoing. It's just incredible, isn't it? How this case, something that seemed, at least initially, like a pretty straightforward traffic stop, has opened up all these broader conversations about the law, about individual rights, about what it really means to live in a just and equitable society. That's the power of a case like Angelito's when you say yeah. it forces us to really confront those big questions head on, to really examine those underlying principles that we sometimes take for granted. And it definitely gets you thinking about what happens next, right? I mean, how will this ruling actually shape the future of policing, of law enforcement in the Philippines? Are we going to see changes in how police officers are trained, how they approach things like traffic stops going forward? Those are all such important questions. And you can bet that legal scholars, policymakers, probably even folks within law enforcement itself, they're all going to be grappling with those questions for quite some time. This case, it really does have the potential to be a turning point. Because it's not just about one man and one single incident anymore. It's about setting a standard, right? Yeah. Drawing a line in the sand. Exactly. The Supreme Court's decision in this case, it sends a very clear message that they're taking this right, this fundamental right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, they're taking it very, very seriously. And that message, it's going to have ripple effects. It sets a precedent that other courts will no doubt look to. And of course, it puts law enforcement on notice that their actions, their decisions will be scrutinized. So in a way, this case, it's still unfolding. Even though the Supreme Court has issued their ruling, the story's not over yet. I think that's a really great point. The impact of this ruling, it's going to continue to be felt for years to come. It's like, as the saying goes, dropping a pebble in a pond, the ripples just keep spreading outward. It's also a good reminder, I think, that we all have a role to play when it comes to shaping the kind of society that we want to live in. I mean, if we say we care about things like justice, fairness, individual rights, then we have an obligation to pay attention to cases like this one, to try to really understand the issues at play and to make our voices heard. I couldn't agree more. The law, it isn't some abstract concept that exists in a vacuum. It is a reflection, a direct reflection of our values, our priorities as a society. 
and we the people. It's up to us to ensure that the law reflects the kind of world that we want to live in, the kind of world that we want to leave for future generations. Yes, this has been such an incredible deep dive. We started with what seemed like, on the surface anyway, a pretty open and shut case about a firearm. And now look at where we are. We've delved into the complexities of Philippine law, explored issues of police conduct, and really grappled with that delicate balance, that constant tension between protecting the public and upholding those individual liberties that are so essential. It really speaks to the complexity of these issues, doesn't it? And it underscores just how important it is to have these conversations, to engage with these really tough questions, even when there aren't any easy answers. It's definitely given all of us a lot to think about. And listeners, we hope you found this deep dive to be as thought-provoking, as engaging as we did. If you are interested in digging a bit deeper into this case, learning a bit more about Angelito's story, maybe even exploring some similar legal battles that have shaped this debate about probable cause and warrantless searches, we'll be sharing some additional resources, some further reading on our website. You can find a link to that in the show notes. And of course, don't forget to join us next time for another deep dive into a topic that's sure to challenge your assumptions, broaden your perspectives, and hopefully leave you with even more questions than answers. Until then, thanks for listening.